Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Mary Chevreau. I'm the CEO with the Kitchener Public Library, and I'll be your host uh, for the session. But before I do that, I'd like to start with a territorial acknowledgement. So with that in mind, as we gather, we are reminded that the library is situated on land that is the traditional home of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the net neutral people. We recognize and deeply appreciate the historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions Indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening this community. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here and reaffirm our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our community. This is also our second time welcoming Kathy Reichs to Kitchener Public Library. She's always such a delight to have and uh, is always a sold out uh, uh, crowd to a sold out crowd. So we are so very honored to have her again. The last time she was here was 2016, also imagine it event and it was standing room only in the theater. She, Kathy captivates us with photographs and details of some of the cases she's overseen that turned into ideas for her books. And I'm sure tonight will be as delightful as always. And now it's my absolute delight to introduce today's moderator, Lisa Drew. Lisa's the co-anchor of the 570 Morning News and the Morning Managing Ed Editor. Anchor, reporter, volunteer, mentor. Recent honors include the 2014 Cambridge YWCA Women of Distinction Award and a 2015 Edward R. Morrow Award for a series of sex trafficking in Waterloo Region. Lisa is a proud supporter and volunteer with the United Way. She always serves as an MC for a number of charity and women's events locally and is a wonderful community cheerleader, a homesteader, and a goat mama. We invite you to follow Lisa on Twitter and Instagram at Lisa Drew Radio. Thank you, Mary. It is great to say good evening instead of good morning. I'm so happy <laughs> that everyone's well and safe and uh, kind of joining us in our pajamas, which is uh, really exciting as well. Uh, I'm a big book lover and also a very big uh, fan of everything that goes on at 85 Queen. I've been to a number of your packed houses and events there. So uh, absolutely thrilled to be meeting Kathy Wright tonight. And I am a uh, full disclosure, a first timer in her lab, but already a huge fan. And now I have something to look forward to for the rest of this stay at home pandemic stuff that I have so many other books to spend with Tempe and with Kathy Reichs and the joy that she's bringing to so many of our listeners and Facebook viewers tonight as well. So I'm absolutely honored to tell you a little bit about Kathy and then we're gonna get into our chat tonight. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Let me tell you a little bit about Kathy Wrights. Her first novel, Deja Dead, was a number one New York Times bestseller. It won the 1997 Ellis Award for best first novel, like pretty incredible. A Conspiracy of Bones is her 19th entry in the series. It features a forensic anthropologist, Temperance Brennan, Kathy was also a producer for the hit Fox TV series Bones. I know we have a lot of fans joining tonight about that. And that's based on her work and her incredible novels. Dr. Reichs is one of 100 forensic anthropologists ever certified by the American Board of Forensic Anthropology. She has served on the board of directors. She's vice president of both the American Academy of Forensic Sciences and the American Board of Forensic Anthropology. She's currently a member of the National Police Services Advisory Council here in Canada. She's also a professor at the Department of Anthropology at the University of North Carolina, and she divides her time between Charlotte, North Carolina, and Montreal, Montreal. From teaching FBI agents how to detect and recover human remains, to separating and IDing commingled body parts in her Montreal lab, to the forensic anthropology work that she does, Kathy writes has brought her own dramatic work experience to her thrillers. And I'm thrilled now to say hello and welcome you back to Kitchener in such a different way this time around, but welcome, Kathy. We're so thrilled to have you tonight. Well, thank you so much. It's nice to be here. 
A little different this time around. Uh, last time we had a packed house, you saw all of our eyeballs on you. Uh, what does the book tour look like this time around in the middle of a pandemic? It looks like it is right now. Me staring into a screen and talking to people um, virtually. And I love the background that you've provided. There's a bit of a family story there. Yeah, I'm at my beach house on one of the barrier islands off Charleston, South Carolina. It's called Isle of Palms. And um, I'm looking out at the Atlantic Ocean. There are at least two dozen kite surfers out there right now. These wow. people are absolutely crazy. But the picture behind us is a photograph that my daughter took at sunrise on the beach out there. How is it working and trying to sell a book uh, during a pandemic and do an author tour? It's just a lot of video conferences, but what, what are you not doing this time around? Well, I'm not getting to meet anybody face to face. And that's, that's the fun bit. Um, book tours are, you know, you always hear authors whining about how miserable book tour is. And the travel part is indeed miserable, but being there is the payoff. That's what's fun. You get to see your readers face to face, close up and, and personal. And so I'm not getting to do that. So we know you were going to come to Kitchener, but where were you also set to travel? Um, I was set to do about eight different cities in the U.S., Washington, D.C. I was supposed to sm uh, speak at the Smithsonian, um, Chautauqua in upstate New York, someplace, a library in Ohio, uh, Houston, uh, Phoenix, and then in Canada, Montreal, Toronto, and Calgary. Uh, the great thing about uh, a new book out is something new for your fans to enjoy, especially during a pandemic. I'd like to think sales are going well for you, and it gives us a diversion. That's, that's what books bring to all of us, an adventure and a diversion, something we can learn, and a new adventure to travel along with you, but also Temperance Brennan. Uh, how, how is she doing? The fans and reading the book, it's a different temperance that, that we're seeing this time. She's really broken in the 19th book, and she's really having a big struggle for so many reasons. Bent, but not broken, I would yeah. say. Yeah, she's got a lot on her plate. She's got some health issues. She's got a new boss that hates her and has exiled her from the medical examiner's office in um, Charlotte. She's uh, trying to pursue a case, but having to do it outside the system because she's in exile. She's having to go rogue, in a sense. And she's having these health issues that make her question for the very first time ever her own perceptions. Can she really, and that's kind of the, that is the theme of the book on two levels. On her personal level, what's real and what's not real? How can she trust? I mean, she normally, Tempe deals in physical evidence, hard data. And at one point in the story, there's a fire and she loses all of that, her computer and all of her hard data. So the only thing she has to rely on is what's in her head and she can't fully trust what's in her head because of the health issues that she's experiencing. So that's really hard for her. And it, on a broader level, that's the theme of the book for society because we're all constantly bombarded in today's world with information and disinformation and misinformation. Anybody can get on the internet or have a blog or get on the airways and say anything they want. So how does the average reader or listener sort through all of that? How do they determine what's real and what's not real? What's fake news and alternative facts and, and what's real? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't all just come from, you know, from wackadoo conspiracy, theor conspiracy theorists. It also comes from people in authority. So how do you sort through all of that? Yeah, so we'll put the word out there, fake news. I mean, we struggle with that daily as being accredited members of, of the media as well, um, especially now when we're dealing with something that the whole world needs to get true and accurate information on. We're dealing with the middle of a pandemic. Uh, Temperance is really struggling. She's dealing with that she beast of a boss, but she's also lost her beloved boss. And there's so many things going on around her, but it feels like she's really alone on this one. Yeah, she, her boss forever, for decades in Charlotte was the chief medical examiner, Tim Larrabee. And we learn, um, I released a book called The Bone Collection, and it was a collection of four short stories. Novellas, really, I'm not very good at short. Anyway, so there, it's an anthology of four novellas. And one of them is called First Bones. 
and it's an origin story for Tempe. And uh, we learn how she got into the business of forensic mm -hmm. anthropology, which is actually how I got into the business of for forensic anthropology. But in that story, Tim Larrabee is murdered. So she's steely, still dealing with that. This is not that long after that took place. She, she's haunted by old cases. Um, and, and going back to what you do for a living, uh, I imagine you carry that with you as well. And a lot of, I know a lot of this somehow directly makes its way into your books, changing facts and figures and, and some cases, but you're carrying that as well. Well, the cases that, yes, there are cases that stay with you more than others. Um, there are the routine cases, bones are found, maybe they're not even human or they're human, but you give the police a profile. It's not necessarily criminal. So those, not so much. The ones that stay with me, I think, are the ones that um, don't get solved, for one thing. The cold cases that are still open, that the bones may still be in, on the shelves at my lab, and no one has ever identified them, and someone is out there wondering what happened to that friend or lover or family member. Those are the ones that really, really stay with you the most, I think. Um, when you look at your work in Montreal, which obviously you're not traveling to Montreal right now with the travel restrictions, um, what's, waiting for, what's waiting for you when you get back to Montreal? Oh, gosh. You know, there came a point um, a few years ago. I was writing a young adult book every year, a Temperance Brennan book every year, and a screenplay for an episode for the show Bones. So there, something had to give. Mm -hmm. And what, what I let go was the casework. So I'm really not doing case work on a regular basis. I'm available, you know, if the lab should need me, but I'm not going in um, on a regular basis. I do regularly go to Montreal because I have many, many dear friends there. So what's waiting for me, if I ever get to come back, <laughs> are good times with friends and wonderful dinners out and just enjoying the city that I really love. And I can see your face light up when you're saying that as well. Like you're missing it. I do miss it. I, it's, it's such a wonderful city. I'm glad my face is lighting up because I was counting on um, natural light from the windows here <laughs> and it's getting dark. So I've got this lamp going. Hopefully that's good enough. Um, yeah, I do. I love Montreal. I, you know, I love the, the multicultural feel to it, the great restaurants, the, the fact that it stays open, you know, so late at night and just pretty much everything about it, the small neighborhoods, all of that, the open markets. When you uh, wake up in the morning, you have so many incredible titles, doctor, professor, uh, mom, author, uh, a producer. Do you identify with one more regularly these days or during the pandemic or who, who do you connect with in terms of your, your titles over the days, these days? Oh, uh, well, I guess these days it's Grancy because I, you know, I'm isolated in with four grandkids. Um, it's more the writing now. The show, of course, uh, is off. Well, we're not off the air. We'll never be off the air, mm -hmm. but we're not in production anymore. Um, we went 12 seasons. We are the longest running scripted drama in the history of Fox still. So we're pretty proud of that. We did 246 episodes, but we're not in production. So I'm not regularly reading scripts. I read every single one of them. Um, I'm not regularly going to LA to shoot. I'm not writing episodes. Um, so really I'm focusing now, and as I said, I'm not doing casework so much anymore. So I'm really focusing on, um, on the writing right now and particularly on the writing of Temperance Brennan books. Uh, was there a big takeaway doing a TV show? Uh, are there anything hinting on the movie side of things? And, and what did you get to keep as a prop? Oh, I do have uh, one of the things in my office. I just did, it's, it's online somewhere, my Facebook site, I guess, or what's the other one, um, Instagram. I did a virtual tour of my office. Which is incredible, and, by the way, people need to see it. Yeah, well, yeah, I have some strange- you got giraffes? I do have a giraffe in there. I do, I love her. Her name is Roxanne. Um, but I have the back, uh, it's a canvas back. It slips on the director's chair that they would always bring out for me as soon as I would show up. The, the, the crew would bring it out and it has my name on it. So it has our Bones logo and then it has my name on it. So when we ceased production, um, they gave me that and I've got that in my office. Um, any, any movie chatter or anything in the works with any movie studios? 
No, I, that would be really difficult for Temperance Brennan, not impossible, um, but it, it would be very difficult to shift casting. I think people came to know and love Emily Deschanel as mm -hmm. Temperance Brennan, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, David Boreanis as uh, Seeley Booth, and they're both pretty busy these days. Seely, uh, Seely. David has a show on CBS called Seal Team, so he's pretty busy. It, you know, it's a possibility and it's very popular right now to do reunion shows. I think Friends just did one yeah. and Parks and Recreation just did one. So, you know, it's always a possibility. And community too. Um, now that you're at book 19, um, and we know that it was such a rough go for Temperance, what's, what's ahead for Temperance? Well, I am working on book 20. Um, that's one of the upsides to being in quarantine is I have nothing else to do <laughs> that I'm allowed to do anyway. So um, I do stay upstairs at my desk in my office. The kids are really respectful of that. Of course, they're in school. They're in virtual school all, all day. So I'm getting a lot of writing done. So I am working on the next Temperance Brennan book. It'll be different from this one. Um, in this one, the story opens with Tempe receiving these <clears throat> anonymous text messages that have images attached. And when she opens them, it is, they are images of a, a corpse, a faceless corpse, uh, a corpse with no hands and no teeth and no face. So he cannot be identified visually. He cannot be identified with dental records or with fingerprints. So it's a typical case for a forensic anthropologist. And yet, this new she beast, as you call her, medical examiner will not call Tempe in to consult on the case. So she, she for various reasons, I think, it, she becomes committed to finding an identity for this person, finding out what happened to him and getting him back to his family. And I think that faceless corpse, that image, that phrase is really indicative of Tempe's commitment to all the faceless dead that she wants to get back to their families. Your writing style from that number one bookseller at the very beginning to now number 19, um, I was taken because I only know number 19. Again, I'm a newbie in your lab, but I am, you've got me now for life. Um, she really speaks in what we call broadcast style, how we write for TV and radio. It's short, sweet, action-packed, present tense, just gets right to business. That, that's Tempe. Um, how, how has she evolved over 19 years and how has your writing evolved now that we're at book 19? Well, I hope it has uh, evolved. Every now and then I have to, well, quite often, I have to go back and check, a, do a fact check on myself. <laughs> I'll be writing and, you know, I give, uh, talk about Ryan's mother. Well, is she dead or is she alive? Did I do that? In a, anyway, so I'll have to go back and check facts and and when i go back to deja dead for example sometimes i just cringe because there are so many metaphors and similes that i use in there so hopefully my writing has become more polished and more um you know more more realistic uh over 19 books my style is first person voice um i did try a partial manuscript when i first decided to try to write fiction um I wrote about, I don't know, 200 pages. And then I stopped and I read it and I thought, this is so boring. Uh, this is just not working. And I stuck it in a drawer and went away for quite a long time, several years, I think. And then I made up my mind in 1994, I was gonna write a book. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna write fiction, I'm gonna write a thriller, I'm gonna stick with it no matter how long it takes, I'm gonna finish it and I'm gonna submit it. And I switched, I kept the Temperance Brennan character, the idea of a strong um, but somewhat flawed female heroine forensic scientist, um, but I switched from third person voice to first person voice. And then that just really worked for me. It was like I was telling my own story so I've stuck with that through all of the books. Um, so we always see it through her eyes. Mm -hmm. That's one of the limitations to first person voice is you can only see it through the, the character that's telling the story. Um, but that works for me. 
it, and it's almost like we're, we're following along. We are with her. Like when you're watching a horror movie, you're like, don't go to the window. You're like, it's like, your, your cell phone's dead. Don't go in that tunnel and look there, Temperance. You know what I mean? So we are fully along with the action and the movement um, as well. Uh, you take so much from, from your own personal um, career. I don't want to use the word highlights because that might be not appropriate for some of the things we're going to pull from, from your bio, but um, you've been involved with, with the aftermath of 9-11 and also the Rwandan Tribunal with the UN. Um, you've seen um, the worst of humanity, uh, but I'd like to think you've also given back to those families and brought them some hope or, or some conclusion, I guess is a better word. Um, how do you carry that with you as you move on in your career and being in those dark experiences, I would imagine, at the time? Well, I think you've, you've really put your finger on it. it is, and, and this has been said in many interviews that I, I do. I work with the dead, but I work for the living to either answer their questions. They don't always like the answers. You know, when I tell a family that, yes, we've just identified their missing person and that mm. you know person is dead they don't always like the answers but they'd rather know than not know especially missing children i mean what could be worse than not knowing um and also to be able to testify uh, as in the tribunal to testify and bring justice um not everything as i said not everything i do is a criminal case but when it is a situation where one human being is, has brought violence down on another, then to be able to testify in court, and I'm part of a team, I'm only one person, I don't solve crimes or, you know, bring about convictions by myself, but to contribute that one little piece, um, that, that's satisfying. That's, that's why you keep going back and doing the work and smelling the smells, you know, and seeing mm -hmm. what's in the autopsy room. Which we obviously can't appreciate. Um, you've talked about leaving leaving your date, your the end of the day at the morgue and going home to to go on with your your personal life. Is does it get easier? Uh, does it get easier now that you're taking a few things off your plate? Um, you know, I think I was never happy when I didn't get a call from the lab for a few weeks. I think why you know, why don't I have a case? Why am I not? And then when I did get a call and I was trying to write a book, it's like, I don't have time for this. I can't. <laughs> so um, there was always that, that push and pull of, you know, do you want to go in? Do you not want to go in? But um, I, I, I liked the, um, as I said, I liked being able to, 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 to give answers to families, to, to resolve issues for them. Um, I also liked kind of being in the middle of it, going into the lab, and you were right there with whatever is in the news. I mean, we're seeing mm -hmm. the results, the worst of humanity, as you said, but we're seeing it up close and first personal. So I, I did like that aspect of it. Um, here in Canada, you've referenced um, in some of your past interviews, um, you're involved with a Quebec serial killer case. Um, have you done any work or, or helped any uh, Ontario Police, have you done any work that might be connected to something here in Waterloo Region? Um, I, well, I worked for the, for the um, main uh, medical legal crime lab for the coroner for, for Quebec. Mm -hmm. I was employed by the province. So I would not have done work for Ontario necessarily. Um, I did work on, and this was part of the basis for this book. I was inspired in part. I did work on the, ca the murder, the case of the murder of a, um, a journalist in Ottawa uh, who was killed. Uh, and there was a lot of media coverage of this as they're searching. She went missing and they're searching for her and eventually her body was found in the woods um, in the Gatineau area, mm -hmm. which is just outside of, uh, across the river outside of, uh, of Ottawa. And she'd been badly scavenged by bears, the body. So um, that gave me the idea for this. And that's what I do when I write a book. I take that one little nugget of an idea and then spin it off into fiction. So the idea of a corpse being discovered that was unidentifiable because it had been scavenged by wild animals. Now in A Conspiracy of Bones, since the story opens in North Carolina, um, I changed it from bears to feral hogs, which we do have in North Carolina. I've fortunately never seen one, but um, 
Yeah, so that I worked on that case, but normally I would not work outside of, of the province of Quebec. Um, going to the pandemic, which is you know, capturing all of us and we're all impacted right around the world. How do you think this might um, find a place in your future writing? <laughs> Interestingly, um, the next book, which I started, oh, at least six months ago, deals with a disease, a spike in incidence of a disease. Um, it's, it's not an infection uh, such as the pandemic, the COVID-19, but it's the same concept of um, the citizenry being a bit panicky because all of a sudden we've got these incredibly high incidences of this very uh, devastating disease. The other thing I'm doing a lot of research on for the next book is human genome editing. So I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh, your work as a professor, and now that you're you're so popular, so you're well known around the world. You say friends are sending you um, covers of your books in different languages right around the world. Uh, and Bones has been so popular. Is there a way to track, or can you see an uptick in um, students being interested and wanting to go into this line of work? And you're teaching it as well. Uh, is this seeing a new uh, revival or is this just becoming more finite and uh, we're learning? There's absolutely how been- How hard an, is it? <laughs> there's been an explosion of interest in, I think when I started the first book back in 1994, I don't think anyone had heard of forensic anthropology. But somewhere around then, the forensic sciences in general just all of a sudden became hot. And you had all these books and television shows and virtually every mystery and thriller had to have the obligatory scene with the medical examiner or the coroner. That started sometime back in the 90s. And I'm told um, by colleagues that there has been this explosion is the only word I can think of, of interest in, in uh, undergraduates and graduates wanting to, to study forensic anthropology. Universities have initiated programs in forensics or in forensic anthropology that they didn't have before. And enrollments by students have, have increased dramatically. So uh, yeah. Any advice for students? I'm guessing you have to be really good at math. <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't know that you do because you have to be good at understanding it, I think, but we do everything by computer now. So yeah. like you have to have an abacus, you know, <laughs> add up your weights. Um, I, my advice to students that probably is not popular with um, professors in courses in general forensic science is don't do that. Um, if, you, if you get a degree in forensic science, you're going to learn about forensic science, but you're not going to acquire a skill that's going to make you employable in a lab. You need to study chemistry, or you need to study molecular biology, or you need to study biological anthropology. You need a skill, not just a general knowledge of the, uh, of the, the broad spectrum of forensic fields. That would be my advice. You've, you've transferred that into a great writing career as well. And I know there's a lot of would-be writers tuning in tonight. Um, you gave a great Ottawa TED Talk with, with some advice. Uh, what would you say to anybody just uh, trying to get the courage to submit that manuscript or just to finally really, you know, get the laptop out and just, just give it a go? Give it a go. That would be my advice. Um, write. You know, start to write, whether you keep a diary or, or a journal or you write short stories, um, write and join a writing, take courses in creative writing if you can. Um, join a writing group and where others are enthused about writing and keep you motivated to do it and you critique each other's work. Um, mm -hmm. I think those are for very, very beginning writers, that those would be good places to start. What does Tempe mean to you? What kind of relationship does she have with you? Does she feel like she's you, she's your, your best friend, your sister? Uh, what does she mean to you or feel to you these days? 
Well, she, she, yeah, I think I could be best friends with Tempe. Um, she's sometimes annoying. She's very, st the problem is that I think we have very similar personalities. Our makeups are so similar and I've read that, you know, opposites get along better than people that, that are so similar to each other. Um, I think I understand her. Um, I don't believe in this, well, the character took off and did this and I didn't, you know, you're the writer, you're in charge, you have the delete key. So you can control what your characters do and what they say. Now, sometimes the story might take a twist um, that you're not expecting, but again, you're in charge. If, if that doesn't seem like a good idea, you don't pursue it. I'm not a big outliner. Um, my son is a writer. He and I did a young adult series together. We did the viral series of six books, um, which is about Temperance Brennan's 14-year-old great niece, Tori Brennan and her mm -hmm. friends. Um, he outlines everything. He actually has a big whiteboard where he puts, um, cards, multicolored cards that are coded to the different characters and the different scenes. I don't do anything like that. I outline the first six to eight chapters and then I start writing. I just jump right in and start and the, the, the story carries me along. Now it's a feedback process. That isn't to say that I don't get ideas as I'm going uh, or I'll be researching something and stumble on something else and think, that's great stuff. I'm going to use it. What I do as I'm writing each day, I open uh, each chapter is a separate document. So I'll open that document that day. I will edit up to where I left off, um, which brings me up to speed. It also functions to, you know, to edit. I'm, I'm a ruthless editor. Um, and then when I finish each chapter, then I put that into a, an outline. So I kind of do a post-mortem outline mm -hmm. so that by the time I finish writing the book, I have a complete outline chapter by chapter by chapter. And it's useful to me as I'm writing because I don't always remember where I did something or what I, and I can go back and I can find it and change it or draw on it as I'm moving along. You've shared too that you've brought, you've scrolled away little pieces of ideas and, and things that people have shared with you or scrolled away pieces of paper to kind of create or to come out in some capacity as well. So you're, you're just taking it and storing all the time. Yes, I'm, uh, th there's a, um, most of my Temperance Brennan books, maybe all of them at the back, they have a little thing called from the forensic files of Dr. Rex or something like that. And I explain where the idea for that particular book mm -hmm. came from. And in this one, I talk about, I compare myself to an ant whose feelers are constantly out and sniffing the air in that I'm always doing that, looking for ideas. Whether it is a case I've worked on, whether it's something else I've heard about or observed at the lab, whether it is a case I've heard about from a colleague, whether it's a presentation at a professional meeting or an article in one of our journals. I'm always looking for ideas and I will often um, cut them out or photocopy them and stick them in this folder. I actually keep a folder called future story ideas and I stick them in there and you know sometimes when I more often when I'm beginning the next book I might go through there and you know, look at what I thought uh, in A Conspiracy of Bones. For example, mm -hmm. a cousin years ago gave me, she had been researching the sinking of the Estonia, the ferry that sank crossing the Baltic Sea from uh, Estonia to Sweden, I think. And 900 some people died in that sinking. She had been, and there are a lot of theories about why that ship went down, that boat went down. So she had been researching that for years and she gave me all of that material. She said, you know what, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an attorney, I'm very busy, I'm just realistically never gonna be able to write this. Do you want it? So I said, sure. And I stuck it on a shelf and it sat there for years. And then with this book, I was able to pull it out and incorporate that. You referenced um, insects, which I'm sure does help in your investigative work because it, insects can help time date the death of a body, correct? Yes. Based on, uh, you referenced the, the zombie ants, but now we're hearing about these murder hornets. <laughs> Is that going to be in a temperance book next? <laughs> Have you seen pictures of those things? Yes, they're huge. <laughs> like B-52 bombers or something. Yeah, those, yeah. 
So that might somehow factor into what Tempe's up to next. Oh, you never know. I mean, it, <laughs> you never know. It, it, who, yeah, death by hornet or wasp or whatever those things are. Uh, we're going to be breaking. We're going to go to some questions from our viewers, but I just wanted to end our chat with, um, at the end of the book, you referenced, um, as a writer, you're not very, uh, you don't normally share a lot about your private life, but you did reference a gap year that you have taken in the last year or so, and also referenced the connection to Tempe in this book. Did you want to talk about how things are going for you right now after taking a, a bit of time off from Tempe? Yeah, um, I decided Tempe needed a bit of a setback. Um, I was very serendipitously diagnosed with a cerebr an unruptured cerebral aneurysm. They were looking at something else and they said, no, 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 that's fine. But by the way, you have this little bubble <laughs> on okay. one of your cerebral um, blood vessels. So, you know, they fixed it and I'm fine. So that's why I gave that to Tempe. I figured, hey, I had one. She's going to have one too. But now she's having a lot more re repercussions than I did. She's having these, what might be hallucinations. She's having some difficulty with, um, with the medications post-surgically. Those are all her problems. Those were not mine. Well, we're thrilled to hear that you're doing just fine. And we're glad you're with us tonight. Uh, we've got a question from Amy asking, uh, when do you decide to introduce new characters? To introduce new characters? Yes. I introduce yeah. new characters in every book. Um, of course, I have my core ensemble of Temperance Brennan and Andrew Ryan and Skinny Slidell. I think Skinny is my favorite character in the mm -hmm. whole series. Um, but then, and her mother and her sister, we've gotten to know them over the years. And periodically, they go dormant, and then I bring them back. But in each book, I usually introduce some new characters as well. Because you can't just do the same thing over and over and over. You've got to keep it changing. You've got to keep it evolving. Um, you've got to keep it fresh. So every single book, I introduce new characters. Another reason for us to keep reading them as well. Yes. Uh, Allison's checking in. She wants to know, will the Bones collection be put on Audible at some point? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I thought it was. <laughs> so if it's not, I'm not sure why not, because I thought all of them were on Audible. Um, I, I'm not sure the answer to that. I, I could try to find out and put it on my Twitter feed. All right, so stay tuned, Allison. Um, Annie's checking in. She wants to know, will we ever have another story of Sunday night? Yeah, um, maybe. Uh, right now, I'm under contract for uh, another, one more Temperance Brennan book. So I'm focusing on that. Um, yeah, so for now, I'm focusing on Temperance Brennan. Uh, question uh, about the PhD program. I just finished my first year of PhD program in forensic toxicology. This is from Amy. Do you have any advice for someone pursuing a doctorate in forensics? Gosh, I don't know much about um, toxicology. I assume you're getting a PhD in some area of, of, of chemistry. Um, go for it. I think to be a serious, to be a serious player in any forensic lab uh, for anthropology, you have to have the doctorate. Um, to sit for board certification, you have to have the doctorate to even be a candidate to sit for board certification. I think toxicology has different levels of certification. She could go to the American Academy of Forensic Sciences website. I think it's aafs.org or something and go to the toxicology section and contact someone there who's got a program. But um, I, I'd say go for it. How many years are we talking just so we can appreciate the education uh, how many years are we looking at from schooling to get you to, to where you are? Well, typically it's four years undergrad, although that could be five years. Um, and then you need the, the doctorate. And I think the average in forensic, in anthropology, I think the average is um, five years again on top of wow. that. So we're up to nine to 10 years. And then I believe there's still a requirement of three years practicing under the tutelage of a certified anthropologist until you can sit, um, submit, for your candidacy to take to take the board certification exam. So a very big commitment. Joan is weighing in wanting to know, did you have any concerns about having a TV show based on the books when we know readers have their own unique picture in their head about what the characters are like in the books? 
Well, you always, yeah, but that, that can't be your, your guiding principle. And I worked as a producer on the show. Um, and I knew from the get go, um, what Hart Hansen, who's Canadian, he was our showrunner for our first eight seasons, I think eight or nine. Um, I knew from the beginning, the, the idea that he had what to do with the character. I knew the character was going to be different from the book. Um, she'd be working, she'd be in Washington, DC. She'd be working with Seely Booth, an FBI agent rather than Andrew Ryan or Skinny mm -hmm. Slidell. I knew she'd be younger because Fox Network skews younger. <laughs> I had certain lower limits that you couldn't go younger than that because she's got to have that PhD and that board certification, et cetera. Um, so uh, yes, uh, you know, and I did get a little bit of feedback in the first few seasons of people saying, this is different. Yeah. And I would just say, well, you know, think of it as a prequel. You know, she's younger. She's not as polished or sophisticated. She's awkward socially. Um, you think of it as a different manifestation of Tempe. And I think as the seasons progressed of the show, people were good with, obviously, we're good with that because we were still on air 12 years later. Uh, Darlene's got a question. Have you ever reread one of your own books and thought, wow? That's inaccurate, or what was I thinking? Uh, she says she's a new fan and she can't wait to dig in. Well, uh, as I said earlier, I have read uh, sections, gone back and reread sections of, of Deja Dead, for example, and way too many similes. And, you know, I, I, I've cut down on that. All right, Michelle's weighing in. She wants to know uh, what book series do you love to read and get excited about when there's a new one that comes out? Oh, I have to admit, I'm a Harry Bosch fan. Uh, Michael Connolly's, um, yeah, I always look forward to, to one of those. I always go blank when people ask me in interviews, what do you read? And I go, uh, I'm reading all the time, but I can never think off the top of my head of what it is I'm reading. Currently, I'm reading um, The Cuckoo's Calling by uh, J.K. Rowling under the pseudonym John Galbraith, I think it is. A uh, question from Andrea, what would you consider your greatest accomplishment in your professional life? Uh, in my professional life? Um, how do you separate that out? Um, I was recently given the Order of Canada, so that's one of the things I am certainly most proud of, and I think my professional life uh, con contributed to that professional, either as a writer or as a forensic scientist. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. That is a huge honor here in Canada. Uh, Karen would like to know what made you decide to kill off Dr. Larrabee? Was he based on someone who you have worked with? Oh, all of my characters, most of my characters are composites. Um, so there's little bits and pieces of people that maybe I've worked with them, maybe I've just known them. For um, in the early books, uh, Claudel, it was just a picture I saw in uh, La Presse, uh, in one of the French language uh, newspapers in Montreal. Um, Larrabee, he, you know, I have to say he's just, he was just a composite. You don't miss him. Sorry? You don't miss him at all? Oh, I do miss him. Yes, he was a good guy. I mean, it was terrible. It was heartbreaking when he was murdered. Freedom yeah. is asking you, will there be any more virals? Yeah, my son and I wrote virals together. It w we had a good time. Um, my son is a lawyer. I don't know if you, Freedom, if you've ever seen him. He's a pretty hilarious guy in many ways. Um, he hated being a lawyer. And he practiced for about two years. And he came to me and he said, why don't we write a young adult series? So I thought, okay, yeah, why not? So we did six books together. Um, it was an interesting experience because he is a lawyer, he is a litigator. So he's very good at arguing. So he would write his sections, <laughs> I would write my sections, and then we would have our editorial meetings and discuss our, I would edit the manuscript with a, literally with a red pen, give it back to him. And then we would have our meetings and discuss our artistic differences, shall we say. But we worked it out. We did six books. Um, basically, then he dumped me. Um, he signed a contract. He did his own uh, young adult series called uh, Nemesis, Nemesis, Genesis, and Crystallis. And he's also doing a middle grade series with Ali Condi called The Dark Deep. 
And he's also doing some other things I don't think I'm at liberty to talk about yet, writing things. Um, so he's very busy and I don't think we'll be doing... Now, he did recently say something along the lines of, huh, you know, I've been thinking about writing an adult thriller. So maybe he's building up to coming back to his mom to ask about that. Or you could be a competition on the bestseller list. That would be, yeah, <laughs> I'd be number one, he could be number two. Okay. Uh, Trillium is asking uh, question number 13. Uh, what actor would best play Slidell? Oh, I have never been asked about Skinny Slidell. That's a good one. Um, gosh, Slidell is, uh, he's older. Uh, he's very gruff. You know who might be a really good Slidell is Bruce McGill. Do you know who Bruce McGill is? No, no, give us a hint or connect uh, him to a role. Detective on Rizzoli and Isles, going way back. He okay. was the day, the guy that drove the motorcycle up the stairs in Animal House. Okay. Yeah. Look up. Bruce <laughs> McGill. We're all going to be Googling in a few minutes, you know that, right? <laughs> Bruce McGill. He's kind of how I picture um, Slidell, and I, I think he'd be very good at the part. Kathy, it has been uh, a real joy getting a full hour with you tonight. Um, I know this, this year is looking a little different for all of us, but uh, we love that we've still been able to connect with you on such a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, I'd like to say a thank you to you on behalf of our viewers tonight, but I know Mary will way back in right now from the Kitchener Public Library. Wonderful to meet you, and I can't wait to spend more time with uh, Tempe this year. Oh, thank you. Very nice to meet you, too. Thank you. Kathy is, is, is such a beloved uh, author, and we are so delighted that she cho chose to come back again with us uh, tonight, and that we'll, we'll hold, hold you to that, Kathy, to see you again next year. That would be terrific. <laughs> Hopefully in person, uh, if we, if, uh, and I'm sure we'll, we'll sort all of this out uh, eventually. We have and Lisa, and Lisa you're, you are a hometown gal. You do, you do so much for the community. Um, everyone loves you. We love you at the library and thank, thank you. you for everything and thank you for being such such a great uh, host here tonight and for all the great questions. Um, you are I've, really I've a love my time with you, Kathy. Thank, yeah. you. thank you very much. It's been a great it's been a great evening. Thank you for including Good me. Good to you. Thank you. So uh, with that, and uh, without any further ado, thank you again. Thank you to everybody who, I think we had over 100 and almost 150 people uh, tonight for this event. Thank you all for tuning in and uh, hope to see you again next week for our next 85 Queen series. Good night, everybody.